Welcome to Breaking It All Down, I'm Count Zero, and this week I have another video game review for you all. This week I am breaking down on another James Bond game, and Bizarre Creations' second game they created for Activision, and their final game they created before they went out of business. Specifically, I'm taking on James Bond 007 Bloodstone. The game opens with a level to serve as our pre-credits teaser as Bond takes on a group of terrorists planning to attack a meeting of the G20 summit in Greece, specifically a photo op at the Acropolis. This level basically serves to introduce our mechanics for the on-foot and driving sequences. It's also rather long compared to Bond films in terms of its gameplay length. We have four sequences here, a on-foot stealth and straight-up action sequence on a boat, a boat driving sequence, another on-foot sequence, and finally a straight-up car driving sequence before we finally get to the opening credits. Lengthwise, if we, were to, if we were to compare this to a Bond film, this would be pretty close to, say, the pre-credits teaser in The World Is Not Enough. So now we get our opening credits sequence, and it's like your typical opening credit sequence from a Bond film, except they're a lie. Most Bond films, in their opening credits, they somehow relate to the film's plot. Goldfinger's opening credits featured gold-painted women. Uh, World is Not Enough's opening credits featured oil. Casino Royale's featured cards, and so on. Bloodstone's credits, on the other hand, featured DNA helices and diamonds. And of the two of those, only the DNA relates to the game's plot because Bond's chasing after a virus. The diamonds have nothing to do with this. In fact, the only stone in the game at all is Joss Stone, who voices the game's Bond girl, and who sings the opening credits. After the credits, Bond is sent to Istanbul, not Constantinople, to find a missing biochemist who is presumed killed in a boating accident, but who just resurfaced in Istanbul. Why is MI6 involved? Well, because the scientist in question was involved in biological weapons research, and MI6 is very concerned that he's trying to sell what he was working on. The guy's cell phone signal has been traced to some recently unearthed ruins running under the city, so Bond has to sneak in through a construction site. This level introduces us to smartphone mode, which basically serves as the game's detective vision, highlighting enemies in the environment, as well as various collectible pieces of intel that will flesh out the game's story and earn you achievements. Anyway, Bond sneaks through the construction yard, escaping a trap by the construction workers in the process, before Bond descends into the ruins and makes his way through the catacombs, evading some guy trying to kill him with a tunneling machine along the way. Apparently, workplace safety rules are a little less strict in Istanbul if they thought they could pass these deaths off as accidents. After escaping the death traps, Bond learns that a mob boss named Baron has been kidnapping bioweapon researchers in an attempt to get their research from them through torture. I don't know about you, but one would think that you could get more reliable, reproducible, accurate results from, say, breaking into a company's computer systems and then stealing their secret biological weapon formula stuff that way, as opposed to kidnapping scientists, torturing them, and getting them to verbally reproduce the formula or technique or whatever to producing their new technology. Well, one would think that using that method would get you very unreliable results, and honestly, no sensible even evil mastermind would go along with this plan. For example... Minions, have you got me that formula for that bio from Pharmacom yet? Yes, mistress! Good. So, what do we got here? We got ow, 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 ow. This is a weird formula. Eee, ow, ow, ow. It's uh, something about scorpions. Why are there scorpions? Ow, oh, just ow, ow. This is, this takes a long time. Ow, oh, I just... It's got pages of general damage and pain. This, this reads like a copy of the aristocrats joke, but done weirdly. Ow, 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 ow. And then there's lots of dots indicating he died. I told you to get the formula! Not to torture him to death! Without me! I'm sorry! <sighs> this is what happens when you give minions room to interpret. Other minion, come here. You took a 
long time to get here. This angers me. Now, I want you to go to the Pharmacom computer lab, the one that I think I don't know about, and I want you to steal every single one of their research computers, okay? But this time, make sure they're turned off. Okay? Steal all Pharmacom's computers, back over them, and then turn them off. Might as well save some time. Minion 2, come back here. Hi! Bond chases down Baron, and we learn that he's just a middleman. It turns out that he's working for a Russian oligarch named Stefan Pomerov, who also, naturally, has ties to the Russian Mafia, and who has just bought a casino in Monaco. This gives Bond an end to investigate him. Working with him on this is an MI6 agent um, by the name of Nicole Nicky Hunter, a jewelry designer who got roped into working for MI6 by M after she was caught smuggling conflict diamonds into the country. I have to say, I like this little bit that it shows about M's character. M in the Brosnan films in particular felt like a softer character. I mean, she's head of the British Intelligence Service, the MI6, so she's not exactly any slouch, but she always felt a little too clean for something like intelligence. And this really makes it clear that she's willing to get her hands dirty, she's willing to blackmail people to get them to give out information. She's the kind of person who would have had 007 assassinate someone, murder someone, um as opposed to in the Brosnan films where it just felt like the purpose of the 00 section was high-risk investigations as opposed to you need to kill a guy. The plan is for Nikki to distract Pomerov and keep him out of his office while Bond sneaks through the casino and breaks into said office in a very nicely done stealth sequence. Bond finds Baron's recording in Pomerov's safe, proving the connection. However, security catches on to the intrusion and locks down the building, forcing Bond to shoot his way out. The next step in Bond's investigation is to go to Pomerov's refinery in Siberia, where he's mass-producing the biological weapons and stop his operation. Nikki comes along because she thinks that it'll be fun. Why did M involve Nikki in this operation again? Bond sneaks his way into the facility and confirms that, yes, Biological weapons are being made here, and so he needs to blow the place up. This entails 007 having to blow up the coolant and heat exchange systems, which in turn will cause the whole facility to go up. Now, you can take these in any order that you choose, but I found that the heat exchange system portion was a little easier, as it doesn't involve having to navigate through rooms of coolant vapors before Bond succumbs, like the coolant section does. As the refinery starts to go up, Pomerov attempts to escape with a train load of his biological weapons. This leads to a car chase scene as Bond goes along the road next to the tracks, then across the frozen river, which depends on rote memorization for you to tell where helicopters are going to blow up portions of the ice in front of you so you can adjust your course in time. Um... Once you complete the sequence, Bond crashes his car into the train to keep up to keep up with it, and knocking out both Bond and Nikki. <laughs> Bond and Nikki come to and discover that Pomerov is attempting to escape with the weapons on a jet boat, leading the two to hijack a military hovercraft to pursue. While Nikki controls the ship. Bond makes his way through the craft, cleaning out any of Pomerov's men who are aboard, and dumping cargo to increase the ship's speed. After this, Bond uses the gun turrets on the craft to shoot out the jet boat's engine, and then board, fighting off more Pomerov's men and finally killing Pomerov himself by getting him sucked out of the craft. While we don't see the body, considering the temperature of the water and how fast the boat was going, he's pretty much done for. I'm sorry. I couldn't think of a good cold pun for this, and I didn't want to use the I'm on a boat clip. After this, one would think the story would be all wrapped up, but the game decides to keep going in an interesting direction. 
Bond decides to investigate who tipped MI6 off to Pomerov's operation in the first place, because the scientist who started the whole thing couldn't have made the call at the time. This investigation leads Bond to Bangkok, where Bond meets with a member of the Chinese intelligence service who tips him off to a man named Rak, a industrial mercenary from Mongolia on the Russo-Chinese border who specializes in kidnapping experts in various fields and torturing them until they give up on their knowledge for his employers. Again, I just can't see how this could actually produce useful product. Before we can learn more about Rakt, however, Bond's contact is killed by an assassin. Bond chases down the assassin, first through the aquarium where the meat was being held, and then through the rooftops of Bangkok, in a very nicely done chase sequence, and one that, frankly, I would, would have loved to have seen on the big screen. The assassin ultimately hijacks a massive construction vehicle, and Bond ends up pursuing in a much smaller vehicle, leading to another driving sequence. Ultimately, both vehicles end up plummeting into the river. Bond washes ashore and comes to the next morning, while the assassin, on the other hand, drowns. Bond evades the police, who are investigating the whole calamity, and tracks down an old contact of his, Silk, who runs a nightclub in town. Bond learns where Rack is operating from from Silk, and sets down to hunt him down. Bond finally manages to catch up with Rack, but Rack manages to get the better of Bond in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and knocks him out. Bond wakes up in a very, very bad place. One of Rack's prisons, way out in the middle of nowhere in Burma. Bond has to sneak his way out of the prison, fight his way past the guards, including blowing up an APC, and when Rack tries to get away, Bond pursues in a stolen V-22 Osprey. Bond, however, gets shot down, and ends up getting stuck in the jungle again. Bond makes his way past Rack's patrols, and manages to f catch up with, him, with Rack himself at a hydroelectric dam that is currently under construction. Bond fights his way through the dam, and finally takes out Rack, and in the process, finally figures out who Rack is working for. Specifically, Rack is working for Nikki, who in turn is working for some other organization, which we don't get a name for, but I'm going to assume is Quantum, from the last two films. Bond sends her Rack's knife to tip her off, and then chases her down. Nikki is confronted by 007, and Bond demands to know why. Before Nikki can tell Bond who she is working for, a pilotless drone operated by someone working for Quantum um, shoot, uh, just shoots her down, and then the game ends. All in all, this is a solid game. The shooting controls for the on-foot sequences are good. The driving sequences are fairly well done. Indeed, driving is Bizarre Creation's strength from their background in the Project Gotham Racing series and Blur and so forth before that. There is one bit of weirdness that just kind of sticks out with me, though. Bond can't crouch. There is no crouch button. You can't click in the stick. You can't press a specific button or anything like that to get Bond to crouch, which makes stealth sequences somewhat odd. You are literally going from cover to cover, and when you're not behind cover, you're walking normally. That doesn't feel like a Bond thing, or at least not a Daniel Craig Bond. Um, admittedly, Roger Moore didn't crouch much, as I recall. Pierce Brosnan didn't crouch much. It sounded like a little thing, and I can understand if, if Bond is a character who we never see crouching, not having a crouch option would make sense. But it just seems like a weird thing to not have crouching in a game like this. So, that's that. Um, it does bear mentioning that when I reviewed this game, or when I played this game for review, there were still people playing this game online, which impressed me. Um, at least in the team deathmatch mode. A lot of the other modes, unfortunately, don't have didn't have players doing them. Um, so I wasn't able to evaluate those, but there are people still playing team deathmatch. And to a certain extent, I was able to get into a game a little better f in in this than it was for me to f get in a multiplayer game in GoldenEye 007 Reloaded. Maybe it's just because of the style of game, uh, as far as this being a third-person shooter as opposed to 007 GoldenEye Reloaded being a first-person shooter and the games that were released around them. 
however the game's story goes, it really does feel like a Daniel Craig Bond film, particularly towards the end. At the beginning, particularly when we're getting to the blowing up the refinery and the hovercraft jet boat chase, that was a little out there and felt more Brosnan. Possibly, yeah, like definitely more Brosnan. Maybe, maybe more, but definitely more Brosnan. Definitely Brosnan. But at the end, we really got to the tone of what makes of what makes Daniel Craig's Bond different from previous people's Bonds. And it fits very well. I will recommend that you rent this game if you're going to get get this or play this. Again, there's not a lot of people doing multiplayer right now, and so in particular, if you want to get the multiplayer achievements, tough luck. However, the single player is good, solid, it's fun. I enjoyed it immensely, and I hope that you would too. So, for my next video, next week is a non-review week at least for video games. However, well, earlier this week was the Spike Video Game Awards. I watched some of it. I didn't watch all of it for reasons which I'll get into into next week's video because next week I'm going to talk about the trailers that were released at the Spike Video Game Awards and my thoughts on the awards show in general because this is my first year that I've watched it and I want to sit down and discuss what this did wrong, what I liked about it, and what really could be done to improve it because there is definite room for improvement. Until next time, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching.